Today on the Grassroots to Greatness podcast, we have something a little bit different. We welcome Dan Dodge to the podcast studio, who is a coach and tutor who has had a background working in a variety of different environments and countries across the world. With Dan, we discuss how sport can have an impact on people's lives and how we can make this a positive impact on their lives. We also delve into the differences he has seen coaching in different countries across the world. We look into his work as a tutor and talk to him about how does he decide if he thinks someone is a good coach. We also discuss what the grassroots coaches do really well, but also what could be done better. This is a really fascinating chat with loads of different things in there for coaches. I hope you enjoy the podcast and listening to what Dan has to say. Welcome to the Grassroots to Greatness podcast. Today we have a new guest with us with Dan Dodge, who has a slightly different coaching journey to some of the coaches that we've interviewed before. So there should be some really good, valuable stuff in here for all the coaches listening. Um, Dan, welcome. So what we'll start off with is can you just basically talk us through your coaching journey and your journey I think through sport as well up to to this point yeah of course so yeah my my journey sits if you imagine that spectrum of football being from community grassroots up to kind of elite and academy mine sits more towards that, that start um started coaching in 2006 at university at the time didn't like it wasn't comfortable being in front of groups and and talking and and kind of being the focal point but it was part of my university degree, so I did sports science, sports science degree. Um, so I got my level one at university and then did it just to earn some money in the holidays really in kind of holiday camps and you know, kind of on the green with a bag of footballs and being told what to do and you know, guided by other people. Um, did that all the way through. I wanted to go into physiotherapy originally, but coaching was always a way to kind of stay connected into football and kind of uh, uh, learn. So. I did a lot of voluntary stuff within academies before I actually started working as a coach. So I did some voluntary stuff at Gillingham with the first team as a sports scientist and coaching became part of that, kind of got thrown into sessions. Um, actually got into it properly around 2013. Um, I used to work in retail but always wanted to stay in touch with football, with coaches, with essentially it was a release. I used to play football but I wanted that release of being involved in it. So I started working as a grassroots coach with a, I was 19 at the time, I had an under, under 16, so it was just chaos. So I was just trying, I was I was there, right, really wet behind the ears, just done my level one, um, trying to put these structured sessions on for a load of six year olds that were just scattering and you know, I'm, I'm there trying to get them to open their body up and play with the inside of their foot and they're just all over the place. Um, through that kind of journey of doing that, I actually wanted to get better. I wanted to learn, I wanted to do a bit a bit more. So I did my level two. And the main driver for me doing that level two was because I wanted to go to America to coach. So I, travel's a big thing for me and we'll, we'll probably touch on that a little yeah. bit later, but I wanted to use football to be able to see the world. So I needed my level two, because that meant I got paid more when I went to America. That was, that was, my, that was my driver for doing it. Um, but in order to do that and then gain more experience, I started working at some kind of um, like grassroots camps some kind of academies type of stuff you know people that, that run their own academies whilst also volunteering at MK Dons um, with the with the academy teams there so I was kind of getting this full spectrum of, of sport um, did that went to America did the whole kind of summer camp thing um, was, was in California for, for six months so worked with four-year-olds worked with 16 year olds worked with men's teams throughout that, that period um, came back and then basically started a career again and I wanted to work in football. That was that was what I was, that was my, wanted to leave retail, I wanted to come back, wanted to work in football. Um, so I actually went into the kind of back side of the game before I worked as a, on the grass as such. Um, I worked for the FA as a, on a business support internship. And then what that did was connected me to all the county FAs and gave me the access to go and meet different coaches, meet different people. And then from there I went to the foundation at Tottenham where put me on the grass a little bit more but it was within kind of community estates within schools within college programs um was there for eight years so a lot of my stuff is sits behind behind the on the grass stuff um, but always stayed in touch with grassroots teams coaching coach developing yeah so that's it's interesting because actually our journey started pretty much the same um i i wanted to go to america so i've done my level two 
and that, and that was it. <laughs> so I'd done my level two, passed it, went out to America a week later, came back from America, America and decided, right, I want to coach. That's, that's what I want to do. I want to be in, I want to be in football. Um, and you say about the chaos, I started with an under sevens team when I was doing my level two and my coaching badges when I got back from America, the under sevens team, and I've now come full circle and I'm managing an under sevens team next year, which is, is just exactly like you described there, it's chaos. But now I know that actually that chaos is a good thing mm-hmm. for under sevens. Um, I'm embracing it now, mm-hmm. whereas back then it was a bit like, oh, yeah. my life, how do, I, how, do I get this, how do I get this team to structure, these players to structure? It's very similar. I think I, passed, I think I passed my level two like four days before I was due to fly out, so I was already going anyway. Yeah. And I think my first camp was in West LA, and because I, I was a bit older when I went, I, I, um, I made, made me run the camps. I've never done it before, really. I've been involved in camps, but never run them. Um, so I kind of asked the coaches I was doing like, which, which age group do you want to work with and I ended up with the, I think it was called Fun in the Sun so it was like four to six and I had seven four year olds basically like, one of them had literally just turned four it was babysitting service there's no interest yeah. in football so I've gone in there fresh off my level two and at the time it was kind of like technically skilled game wasn't it yeah. I've got yeah. all these session plans where I'm going to do this this and this and I've set up my first session I think it lasted seven minutes before yeah. they were just okay and I actually spent more time playing hide and seek with a football try, still try, I'm trying to make it relevant and trying to get yeah. the football out but I spent more time playing hide and seek and games than I did doing any coaching at that point yeah yeah and it, it was it was similar for me out there um, it, it was a big learning curve the learning curve more probably from being abroad and living abroad rather than from the and from the coaching perspective it is like, how do I engage these kids because half of them aren't bothered they don't want to be here mm-hmm. um, completely different culture to, to obviously what we have here um, but it was a good part of my, my learning journey and managing people as well for the first time how, how did you find that managing people yes I, at the time I found it quite difficult um, to manage different people I'd, I'd come from a, a bit of a retail background at that point so I'd, I'd, I'd spent six years working in retail managing people so I had that skill set to, to yeah. do that um, it was just managing different people managing young coaches who are you know, excited because they're in America for, for the first time and trying to manage their expectations of what we you know we, we can go we can go out and we can go and see things we can go and see the country we've got a job to do so yeah it's trying to align people I think rather than manage them yeah yeah no that's fair enough um, so your your background and your kind of philosophy on things is about using sports to have positive impact on people and obviously a lot of the work you've done at the foundation would have been not necessarily based around improving players technically tactically but having a positive impact on people's lives so um, just talk us through how you think sport and football can have that positive impact on people's lives yeah I, I think it's it's key and I think it can be so influential and I think I, I look at sport and, and specifically football as a vehicle football is a vehicle to engage people and then the outcomes come off the back of it and yeah there's, there's so it's such, such a wide spectrum it's, it's connection to a group to a sport to people you know it, it I, I've been fortunate enough to be to deliver courses and, and programs all over the world and I don't have to be able to speak the language. We can connect through playing. Um, I think you've, you know, the the behaviours and the attributes you get from being part of a team, from being part of a group that's got structure and rules. That, that, that's you know so far reaching the discipline of doing it, the kind of resilience to to bounce back up from things when it doesn't go your way, the communication skills, the building rapport with people, all of those things. I think it's, it's huge. And if you've, so if you can relate that to. Maybe say so, so if you're kind of coach, let's say an under sevens team, or what's the difference in how you build those kind of with an under sevens team compared to maybe if you're going to work on an estate or in a, an area of deprivation with with people? How or not necessarily what's the difference, but how do you how do you just embrace that and, and get that impact? Yeah, so, so I think with, with an under sevens team, they're, they're there because they want to be there, they want to play football. So you can use that to channel it into drawing out whatever kind of impact you you, you, know, you want. You've already got their engagement, they're already hooked. Parents are already bringing them there. They're already in, most of the time, in, in kit, in football boots, in you know, and they, they turn up when you want them to be there. 
um, and you've obviously got the support network of the parents bringing them and, uh, and all that stuff. When you're looking at kind of estate-based programs, that stuff isn't always there. Most of the time it's, it's not there. And you know, I've cut countless examples of, of delivering sessions and the kids haven't got boots, haven't got trainers, haven't got sports kit, they're in a school uniform. Um, but they're there because they want to be with their friends or because they feel safe. And I think you can't, can't go into um, kind of estate-based programs with, oh, I'm going to go and deliver this session. I'm going to turn up with my bag of footballs and my cones and I'm going to run technique skill game because they're not there for that. They don't want to necessarily be improved as players straight away. You've got to build that rapport with them first before they're going to listen to you. Um, so for, as a coach, it takes a di completely different skill set. Yeah. But it's, you've got to look at the reason they're there. How, how do you go about building, starting to build rapport in, in those environments? So you have, to, you have to meet them on their level. They have, they have to, it's, it's kind of basics of kind of trust and, and being relevant, being likable. So you've got, you've got to start with that. So you can't go in there and, you know, I'm the coach, listen to me, because go on, you, you lose the whole group and your life will be quite difficult. So you've got to go in and almost find a connect with them, whether that's you know, the area, the team, Minecraft, you know, whatever, depending on the age, obviously, but you find something you, that, that you can connect with them. So they actually go, all right, he's all right. You know, he's, you know, he gets us, he understands us. It's, that's the, the understanding is the key thing. I think because because when I look at it now, I mean the area where, the area I live geographically, you've got it is classed as an area of deprivation. A lot of this where where we live, but it's it's actually it's quite a nice place to grow up. There's pockets of places that have got more deprivation. That's where there's more estate based sessions. Um, but there will be loads of kids that are trying to integrate maybe into grassroots teams or kids from the estate sessions that can maybe benefit from integrating into those teams, which is not an easy journey. But if, you, if, you've, got, if, if you've got grassroots coaches here that are then working with players and they know that a couple of players in that team maybe struggle to integrate with a group or they come from a background where they haven't got everything all the other kids have got, how would you kind of deal with that? Yeah, so I think you've, you've got a, it's not it's not a quick easy answer, but I think you've got to find you've got to find the levelers. You know, you've got to, you've got to find a way to help that group or that individual or individuals not feel isolated from everyone else. And you know the, the way I'd approach that if I was in a, a kind of structured kind of team setting is you know I'd, I'd be including them in decision making almost, or I'd have some kind of process where you know, captain changes or captain rotates that kind of stuff. So you level out the players and you take away the the, the fact of they've got more than I have they've got they've got the, they've got different thing yeah it's, it's yeah it's, it's I mean that's a difficult that's a difficult question I've, I've just laid on you there but um and actually uh, I, I I challenge on it going do all kids need to be involved in organized grassroots football or actually as long as there's somewhere where they're going where they're fun safe engaged etc mm -hmm. like that that's where we can have a positive impact and I think what What's key for me is getting across to coaches of you're working in grassroots and you're thinking, right, how can I improve players? How can I make players better football players? Mm -hmm. Most of them are not going to go on and play top level football. Yeah. But as a coach, you can still have a massive impact on their lives. And we've got more kids with uh, issues with well-being, mm -hmm. um, probably less, less resilience at the minute. And maybe we need to switch our thought process in coaching to go, well, it's not just about technical tactical. Yeah. It's about it's about the other things like resilience, for example, is a big thing. I mean, do you have you had to do a lot of work with that in the past on helping kids develop that, whether that's youth work in the estates, in coaching programs? Is that is that something you've done some work with? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think um, sometimes it, come back to that like, kind of last question about integration. Sometimes you use those individual players to demonstrate resilience to the others because it, again some of some of the estates that, that I have worked in are from some of the most deprived boroughs in London so what I see as resilience coming from a relatively stable childhood you know, they're experiencing it kind of tenfold already so I think sometimes you you have to understand what resilience is for that individual what we talk about it we can define it but is it relative to the person um, I think 
you have you, it's all back it's about meeting them where they are and understanding what it looks like for them yeah uh, it's, it's interesting because th- that what you've said there I think the same principles apply no matter what environment you're in but it just slightly changes because if you're trying to connect with someone getting on their level and mm-hmm. their understanding of what they're doesn't matter whether they're in the estates program whether they're playing beach football whether they're in a grassroots environment whether they're playing in a playground the more you can connect with the individual mm-hmm. the, pro- the more you're probably going to get out of them 100% you, you know you have to Ultimately, whether whether you're a, whether a youth worker, whether you're someone like me that works in those deprived areas, or whether you're a grassroots football coach, your your job is to connect that that child to, to sport and to football because of you know the, the physical, mental well-being that comes off the back of it, the friendships they build off the back of it, the you know the behaviours and stuff they build off the back of it. Our job is to connect them to football and to sport, and by we have they have to enjoy it for that. So from us going in forcing technical tactical stuff because we think that an under eight has to be able to do xyz it's probably not it's not the focal point you know we, i know we've definitely had conversations before about you know, kind of parents and you know when the game finishes the, the parents in their ear on the way home saying oh you should have done this should have done that no no like they're, they're eight like just let them go home like leave it um you know i i, I played football from under nines we won the league at under 11s. Does it impact me now? No. No. So, so as coaches, why, why are we focused on how many games we've won, how many trophies we've won? It, it's irrelevant. We're trying to build a young person or an individual that have got life skills for the future. Yeah, and I think that's key in remembering like, you're developing people. That's the way to look at it. You're developing mm-hmm. people, you're not always developing football players. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, brilliant. Um, so, can you give some kind of specific examples of how coaches can use maybe their language, their actions, their behaviours um, with young people just so you can try and have that positive impact on them? And that's quite a broad question, but just chuck some examples out. Yeah, so I think if, you know, if we're looking at um, you know, young players, you, you know, your session can be based around a TV programme, a computer game something that they're engaged in so your language you know it might be you know you might not be you might not be scoring a goal you might be shooting a rocket yeah that something like that something that they can relate to that they they get hooked in and that engages them that allows them to practice the technique and the skill you want them to without labeling it as a technique or skill um and i think if we're looking at okay i'm going to go right to the other end of the spectrum i'm going to go to kind of 40 you know 14 to 16 in the community estate they have to understand that one, you know what you're talking about, or that you can structure a fun session first. So then it would be going to like a, a, a more games-based approach to get them to get their buy and build that rapport, essentially for them to trust you know what you're talking about before you go in with loads of technical stop, stand still, do this, do that kind of stuff. So you would you say? So if we go back to the, what what. It's something we've not asked yet. Like, what what's your philosophy as a coach? So, what would you like people to, if you were doing a session, what would people say about you as a coach? So, so for me, it's about actually playing the game. So, I want it to be. It's got to be engaging. Everyone's got to be active. Everyone's got to be doing something, and it's got to look like the game. So, I I will tend to use a lot more kind of whole part whole stuff where just start off with a game get them active get them engaged setting scenarios and the scenario will be linked to the coaching bit I want to do in the middle and it, that, can, that can be anything that could be counter-attacking it could be staying compact but I'll link it and I'll, I'll get their brains engaged in that early on and I'll use teams I'll use a game from the weekend I'll use you know their favourite players to do that but then I'll drip in I'll kind of hide the learning in it in the middle yeah. what well, um I'm going to be completely off topic now of what I've talked about, but I'm trying, I'm trying to think of things I get asked all the time. And one is about behavior. Mm-hmm. So when you get, obviously your philosophy, you've talked about understanding players, being patient, like getting them to know you. When you've got players that aren't kind of behaving to the standards you expect, but you're also having, you're having such a small time with them, how do you start to slowly change that? Because on an estate, yeah, without stereotyping, you might 
people get people that can be a bit more difficult to deal with or will do what they want because they don't have to be there they can just go and do whatever they want mm-hmm. where, when they want when you've got your grassroots session you're still going to have players then that aren't engaging or on a walk off or aren't having the standards that you'd, you'd expect but with either of those environments we don't just want to like dismiss those kids mm-hmm. so how do you start to kind of get them to, to share the values of the group and the behaviours of the group without but understanding that's a slow process what what types of things would you do yeah and it's, it, it's I mean, the, 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 the first thing to kind of my first comment my initial comment back to that is yeah, being a grassroots coach is really hard yeah because yes you're you're there you're there as a coach and quite often you're there because you've got a son or daughter in a team and you have found yourself being the coach but you're also sometimes a parent sometimes a social worker you've got all, young people come with especially now like nowadays they come with so much so you have to try and manage that as well and i think it's it's bearing that in mind but it, you also have to have structure you have to have rules in place you have to have codes of practice you have to you can't just have even in a state you can't have kids just doing what they want um some of the, some of the things i've kind of used in the past to to kind of tackle it, it's almost getting the groups to create their codes of practice and don't call it rules because rules sounds negative yeah cause it call it a positive behavior framework these are the things we're going to celebrate so rather than don't talk when i'm talking it's it's can we can we listen to each other so you just change the language of what you're asking them to do so it's a positive connotation rather than don't 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 um if you use that use that before and that, that's worked really well because you're giving the, the players the ownership of it and by helping them kind of co-create it, they get the ownership, and then the, generally the buy-in increases. Um, you know, with with grassroots environments, you've got the most of the time you've got the luxury of, of parents or a sort of a parent or carer that's bringing that, that that child, so you get them on side as well, help them understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because you know, sometimes parents will see their, their child not engaged and they come for you at the end of, end of the session why have you why haven't you helped him why haven't you supported him without really understanding why they're there so involve them in it involve them in involve them in that kind of conversation do your team talks in front of the parents so they understand what you're asking them to do yeah. what you're asking for your players um, but you have to, you have to have a standard you have to have a, a code of practice with regardless of what you la- label it yeah you have to have something that you hold each other everyone accountable to i think as well we've always talked about the more that you can get people to buy in and design that as well mm-hmm. and what the standards are going to be the easier it is to uphold it and mm-hmm. they should then self self police it a little mm-hmm. bit really yeah. just before we get to the last part of the podcast it'd be great if you could follow the tsc coaches club on all social media We're on facebook twitter instagram you can follow us for free on patreon and you can we'll listen to the podcast on spotify and apple podcasts as well as on YouTube. If you could subscribe to those channels, it will be a great help to us. Thanks again for listening. Okay, so obviously you've, you've alluded to it already that you've worked in loads of different countries. Um, do you give us a quick list of those countries? But also, uh, what's, what are the differences you've found from coaching in, in all these different places? Yeah, yeah, it's quite, it's quite, quite a long list. Um, Caribbean, so Caribbean islands. Africa, a couple of places, a couple of countries, so Nigeria, Ghana, um, obviously America, like I spoke about. Um, I've done some kind of work in, in Europe around kind of taking teams to tournaments and that kind of stuff, but um, projects are those ones, and also India, China, so quite a, quite a breadth, of, breadth of the world. Um, the, a lot of that's been coach education focus on working with coaches and helping them kind of work with their own players and their groups. I think one one thing that's been common across the world isn't it? It sounds really kind of cheesy, but like football is a unifying thing. Uh, I kind of alluded to it earlier. It doesn't matter if we can speak the same language; we could play in the same team. We'd find a way to communicate what what we want. Um, I think what's very what's very different is um, probably the view on how football should be played. Like the the our views of from being from Europe and from UK are kind of held quite high. Um, sometimes the practice in those countries is quite far behind that. So obviously we talk a lot about over here about kind of you know, bus queues and lines and everyone active, ball rolling time. 
that you go to, to Africa and Caribbean and India, those three places, it's still very much stop, stand still, static, static stretches, that kind of stuff, yeah. and you know, one ball and, and cues. And a lot of that is often down to equipment. You know, we're, we're quite spoiled in this country with 3G pitches, with the equipment we get. Most teams will have kind of 10, 15 footballs for a group of 10 to 15 players, so you can do a lot of ball each stuff. I've been in places, um, you know, India and the Caribbean, where you've maybe have three footballs and you've got a group of 40 kids. And you've got to find something that's beneficial and engaging. And But then the flip side of that is what the children perceive as engaging is different. Cues are natural to them. Yeah. So therefore, they're maybe not, they're not as disruptive maybe as kids in the UK are if they're standing in the queue. Well, they've got better attention spans. Yeah. But then you could, without going deep psychologically on it, but since there's, there's probably a lack of technology and stuff like that out mm-hmm. there, that that's not, are the kids' attention spans here have got shorter and shorter, haven't mm-hmm. they? Technology, mm-hmm. the instant gratification of, of stuff there. Yeah. Um, what, what, what country did you, except for obviously this country, what country do you enjoy coaching in the most and why? Cool. Um, I think the one I, I probably enjoyed the most is India and I think there's probably a sweet spot around language and communication because English is near enough the kind of first or second language in most of the places I've been to but the engagement of people in India is, is through the roof um, both as players and also as coaches so I, I I think it was one one program we did, and we were we were on the grass from seven in the morning until eight at night, because <laughs> and they were constant through the heat through everything. So you know, and over here sometimes in, in kind of coaching courses, as we both know, like sometimes we get to the end of the day three four o'clock and energy levels are gone. Yeah, these guys they were going that are constant. So as a deliverer, that's great because you you can you feed off of their energy. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it was, so it was, it was it was great fun. That's got to be tough as well because I know if we <laughs> if we deliver a course nine till five by five, we're we're, we're knackered but as well. But there is you know there is there is that you, you do feed off of the energy. So yeah. When you've then got kind of they're just kind of sponges. They just want they want more. They want games. They want sessions. They want to ask your opinion and stuff. And yeah, it's, it was it was great. Brilliant. No, that's 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 really interesting, and I think that's. That feeding off the energy as well is like it's so important to get an environment where you bounce off each other mm-hmm. and and you challenge each other as well. It's not just about everyone agrees with what you say. You don't want an echo chamber, but mm-hmm. you do. You want to be in that environment where everyone's trying to learn, everyone's trying to improve. And I think in grassroots level as well, if you can get a into a club like that and around coaches like that, you push each other on mm-hmm. so quickly. And I think that's the, what I enjoyed the most about my time in academy football was. Everyone will be there for at least an hour after their session, mm-hmm. talking and discussing, debating things, and like that energy that you got around the place before the session, after the session. Those discussions really helps push push people forward. Mm-hmm. And it's not always easy to find those environments, but if you've got those the right people around you, that's that's a big benefit. Um, mm-hmm. The next question then is. If, and you just talked there about coach development. You do a lot of coach development in, in those countries. Mm-hmm. Um, when you work with coaches as a coach developer, what you're looking at coaches to figure out, ultimately you've got to figure out, are they, are they a good coach for the level they're doing or are they not ready yet? What would you say, when you look at a coach, makes you think, yes, they're, they're a good coach? Mm-hmm. I think the the paramount thing for me, I think, is the understanding of their the level they're at, and I'm, I mean their players. So understanding if they're an under sevens coach, what does football look like at under sevens? Now we we all have aspirations and we all have plans to to kind of progress and go on to you know through you know, level one, UEFA C, B licence, etc. But what it's your understanding of where you are now, what football needs to look like for the, for that age group? Because um, you know the things around practice design, session structure technical tactical information we can learn that but yeah. if you don't understand what you're starting with and where you need to, where you need to pitch what you're doing I think for me that's the key thing yeah what um, what's so let's go back to that then so if you saw someone working with under sevens and then another coach with under elevens what would you hope they see the differences between how to coach those age groups and what players want so you know generalisations around like attention span 
those kind of things. So I'd expect an under sevens coach to be using different language for one, but also really short and sharp interventions. Whereas an under elevens coach maybe can have dig into a bit more a bit more detail because the attention span of the players and the understanding of the players is there. Um, for me, anything kind of and this is just a personal personal kind of approach and philosophy, but anything kind of six, seven, eight, nine approaching on ten should be around ball each. So personally I don't want to spend time as a coach with an under eights team trying to get them to pass the ball because psychologically that's not where they're at. That's not of course there are anomalies to that, but general as a generalisation, that age group want the ball and they want to score and they want to dribble and they want to run. So that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm not going to try and um, curtail their kind of want for the ball, want to be on it. I'm going to maximise that as a sweet spot and just try and get them good at it. If I if I end up with a, a team of eight year olds that are all just dribblers, brilliant. Because when we get to 11, 12, 13 and we understand teamwork, that's when I'll start to start to build on that. Yeah, that's brilliant. No, that's that's really good. That's really what um, we've worked with a lot of coaches, obviously, and we've we've helped to to develop a lot of coaches. What would you say some of their, without being too critical, what when do when do people show their limitations? What, what do you think goes against them? Maybe sometimes. Uh, as a as a real again real generalisation, I think sometimes there's almost this kind of coach's ego. I kind of touched on it earlier when one of my points about kind of when I was playing, but the important thing for children when you're coaching them or when you're involved in that setup is that they're enjoying themselves. It doesn't matter if they win or lose to a, to a certain extent, unless you get into certain environments, certain leagues, and we start to progress through a pyramid, that's, that's slightly different, but it shouldn't matter whether they win or lose the game. Your behavior shouldn't change, parents' behavior shouldn't change. It's about, it's about fun and enjoyment. And you know, at seven, eight, they're not pigeonholed to a position. Coaches sometimes do that because they want to win the game. Oh, he's, he's, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a centre back. No, he's not. He's not. He's seven. You know, there's countless stories of professionals who have started in one position and end up playing another, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Loads. And you know, you go through so many changes, kind of psychologically and physically, between you know six and twenty. You can't pigeonhole people to, to positions. So I think that's something that is always a, a a big challenge back for me as a coach developer. Scott so and so and he's a striker. Well, why is he a striker? Are you is he does he want to play as a striker? Uh, where's it coming from? It comes from somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, no, good. Um so based on looking back still at grassroots football, what would you say the and I've I've asked previous people this, what do you think the best thing is about grassroots football? And if you were in charge of grassroots football across the country what would you change? So for me, the best thing about grassroots football is, is, is the, it's the connection. It's the connection to something. It's the ability to go and express yourself and express others. Like you can, regardless of your ability, regardless of your kind of philosophy of the team is what you can go and play football and you can go and find a space for you that fits you. I think if I was in charge of it, and this is a big ask, but yeah, I'd, I'd just make it accessible. I'd, 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 re, I'd tackle those barriers that stop people accessing it. So whether that's financial, whether that's pitch space, something around that. Yeah, that's interesting because it's funny actually, because when I asked Craig on this podcast, he actually said the accessibility is one of the things that's improved the most, mm -hmm. um, especially in his 10, 15 years of coaching. Mm -hmm. Craig's background is working in um, schools, development centres, academies, uh, in like F Faversham, Canterbury Way, mm -hmm. which is an area which is quite an affluent area, etc. Mm -hmm. um, your background's different. Mm -hmm. So you've then just said actually one of the, the things, there's there's too many barriers, it's not mm -hmm. as accessible, probably based on obviously your, your working background. Mm -hmm. um, how, obviously financial's one, like break, break, financial and availability pitches. What other ways can we break those barriers down? Do you think? You know, it's a big again. My answer comes from a place of, like I say, working in working in London, which is a, a far more diverse community than than Canterbury, as an example. 
I think there's a big there's a big thing to be had around bringing different cultures and communities together. Like I've spoke about it, traveling abroad and, and experiencing it, and I think there are so many. You know, our communities now are so diverse, and it's, there's a thing to have about connecting that. And if you know, if you're a grassroots coach at a, a club, like is your is your club diverse? Is your club welcoming to different communities, different cultures, regardless of the proportion of that community they make up? That's that's the big thing. Yeah, too. and I think that's going to be education, isn't it? Education yeah. society, education within clubs, education to people, um, which I think is getting better, mm-hmm. but. Is it getting better quick enough? I don't think so. And I think actually in in, in areas, like you said, a, a key thing, what you said there is, even if, if you adapt into different cultures, even if that's only a really small part of, mm-hmm. of, of your team or your group or your club, yeah. but having, having that understanding around it will, will break barriers. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it's representation, but it's also understanding, and this is you know, where I speak about kind of, you know, clubs and coaches like you're more than just it's more than just two hours on the grass and a weekend game isn't it you know if you if you have um cultures that have certain practices like are you accounting for that practice within your training times within your match times within what you're doing because if you're not i'm unknowingly that's a barrier yeah and it's, it's that understanding I'm, of course i'm not saying that we all have to go away and educate ourselves on everything but we have to have if we're in a, in a position or a community where that's prevalent, we have to understand it. Okay, so after this podcast, for our Patreon members, you're going to draw on a tactics board a few of your, your favourite sessions. And another question that I find always quite interesting to ask, what did you enjoy when you played football that has then led to how you are as a coach? So and I use it. One example I always use, and I use it on courses, is um, we always get a load of coaches, adults, fully grown adults, and then you go right. If you can, you take the equipment outside, and then you guarantee when you get outside, what they're doing, they're all smashing the ball in the goal. One person standing in the goal, and then the thing they'll all say to their kids is, "Don't all smash the ball in the goal when you go out. Do a warm up, etc." Then they don't do it themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, I relate that to going well. When I was a kid, I, I loved shooting and scoring goals. So in my practices now, I will try and do, make sure that, especially when they get there, I just set a pitch up and go, right, just play a game. As soon as you get there, just play a game. You get to shoot, you get to dribble, whatever. But what what have you, yeah, what did you enjoy when you played football that you've now taken into your coaching? So I wanted, I wanted the ball. I wanted, wanted time on the ball and I wanted to be able to win. Yeah. So I wait to either score, what, and win the game or to prevent someone else from scoring and winning the game. So they're the competition and um, being on the ball. Yeah. So do you make all of your sessions competitive? Yeah. 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 There's, a, there's always a, there's a, there's a way to win or lose the game, whether that's end zones, whether that's goals, you know, possession, whatever that looks like. But there's also a way to stop it. And you know, again, that's quite kind of a tangent, but one of the things we see a lot on courses around kind of attacking practices, people neglect the defenders. Right, they've won it back, but right, give it back to them. Like where's where's the engagement for that? Let them get it counter attack and score a goal as well. Yeah, we I always used to say you've earned the right. Yeah. So if you defend really well and you've earned the right, you've won the ball, you've earned the right, you now get to attack. Yeah. Otherwise if you don't give them a reward, yeah. after some amount of time, they'll either stop defending or when they win it, I'll just I'll be just smashing it away. <laughs> and when, you know, when I say like I wanna be on the ball, like I, if I'm playing, I don't wanna be stopping every twenty seconds. You can give me a point, but you know, it's what's the old saying? Kind of keep keep your invent- interventions to a tweet, keep it to a tweet. Yeah. Get in information, get out. Yeah. Not information about this, this, this. What you want me to do next? What he's doing? What she's doing? And and what happened before? Like, that's irrelevant now. I just want to play. Get in information, get out. Brilliant. Um, right. So this might be the longest question because I know you have got a lot going on. Um, but tell us about everything you're involved with now. And, and moving forward, give out give a shout out to kind of all the works. I know you're doing a lot of great work at the minute, so yeah. So I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it as, as brief as I can. So yeah. obviously, first one is is kind of my organisation, Sport for Change. So that's ultimately using sport and football for social impact. So that will be working with you know a group that's experiencing some kind of disadvantage, whether that's unemployment, kind of disengaged areas, kind of um, homeless even and using sport as a platform and a pathway for them to 
to make a positive change to their life. So that's that's the first one. Um, second one will be the Powerhouse Project, so which is a, an organisation which is solely focused on, on female female empowerment through support and media. Um, so my role there is is kind of head of coaching operations, so creating the programmes and the pathways for for women to start off even not even interested in football, but find a way through to the elite game in a coaching pathway. And then finally, would be would be through life, which is the one where we do a lot of the international work. Um, so they do a lot of a lot of really good work in in Harringay, London, but also have that international arm as well. Brilliant. So I'll put all the links to those uh, companies in the descriptions. Um, and where can we find you on social media? So website website is loading. Yeah. Yeah. Website's loading, but yeah, currently on Instagram, um, support for change. But then also I'm on LinkedIn uh, as Dan Dodge. So yeah, would welcome any anyone to reach out and ask questions or. Yeah. brilliant uh, so thanks for that Dan there's loads of really interesting stuff there different take on it as well and there's, there's going to be loads of useful bits in there for coaches so thanks for coming and we we'll look forward to your sessions that you're about to do as well